I don't want to be ungrateful, but the topic that I was assigned, how to raise Catholic kids, is a topic that I'm not an expert on, and I'm not going to suddenly enlighten you and give you all the answers and change your life tonight. Uh, I don't know any experts on how to raise any kind of kids nowadays. Uh, so please don't look uh, at the, the guru or the expert or anything like that. Uh, just some suggestions. And to trigger your memories, I'm very sensitive to that because I have ADD, which means I'm very absent-minded and I forget everything. Wait a minute, this is planet Mars, isn't it? Didn't I get on Earth by mistake? You know, Earth's a nice place to visit, but I wouldn't want to live there. I'm glad I'm not going to live there forever. Uh, yeah, since I tend to forget things, you do too, and it helps to make the main points visible uh, and palpable and on a piece of paper. So, really, all I have to say is this, but I'll say, say it on the paper, and then I'll read most of these words, and then I'll comment on them, so that'll make a three-point sermon. First, you tell them what you're going to say, and then you say it, and then you tell them what you said. Uh, first point, how to raise Catholic kids. Basic principle of all morality and all ethics and really all of life is uh, treat everything as what it is. So treat kids as what they are. Don't make them out to be something they're not. Uh, why, why do we use things like money and love people and adore God? Why don't we worship and adore money? Well, some people do. Uh, why don't we love money? Uh, why don't we use God? Some people try to. Why don't we use people, each other? Some people try to. That's what slavery is. Well, there's a proper response to everything. You adore God because he's God. If you know him, of course you're going to adore him. And you love people and you respect them as your equals because that's what they are. And you use the things of the world and the things money can buy as means to those two ends, God and other people. In other words, be realistic. To be good is to be realistic. To be a saint is to be sane. Frank Sheed, great Catholic apologist about 50 years ago, uh, wrote two books of the word sanity in them. They're very, very good books. One is called Theology and Sanity, and the other is called Society and Sanity. And sanity simply means living in the real world. And you might say, well, none of us are refugees from an insane asylum, so who's he talking to? Well, all of us really are refugees from an insane asylum, and we haven't quite yet escaped. That's one of the meanings of original sin. I'm I'm astonished. I'm very naive. I mean, I'm old. I shouldn't be naive anymore, but I am. Uh, I'm astonished by how easy it is to sin and how hard it is not to and how stupid sin is and how easily we do the stupid thing. Here, here, here's what sin is. Uh, by the way, I once had a dream about this. Let me tell you my dream. Uh, this was a daydream. It wasn't a, a, a vision or a divine revelation or anything. It was half awake and half asleep, but it was my imaginative musings. Uh, I died and went to heaven, and I was climbing up the great big golden mountain, and at the top was a beautiful celestial city, uh, and I knocked at the door. It was like a castle. And a little hole in the door opened, and God showed his face. He said, what do you want? I said, I want to come in here. May I please come in? And he said, well, yeah, but you first uh, have to find uh, uh, out what you're an expert at, because this is a place for experts. I said, for what? He said, for experts. Everybody here is an expert. So if you're an expert at something, you can come in, otherwise not. And my first thought was, since I like to play chess, uh, they have ratings, and if you get a 2,000 rating, that makes you an expert. 2,400 is a grandmaster. 
uh, I think 2200 is master. And um, I once had a rating of like 1400, which is not very good. So I said, well, maybe if you give me 20 more years, I can develop my skills and become an expert. He said, oh, it's too late, you're dead. Sorry, you're not an expert. You're 700 points below. What are you an expert at? And I said, well, some people tell me I'm a pretty good philosophy teacher. He said, yeah, you're pretty good, but you're not an expert. You're not Socrates, sorry. I said, yeah, you're right. I said, well, I wish I was an expert at raising kids. I wish I was an expert father, but I'm not. I don't think anybody is nowadays. He said, you're right, you're not. I said, well, well, how do I get in? He said, sorry, you can't come in unless you find out what you're an expert at. I said, nothing, I guess. So I started to wander off down into the darkness. Then I got a bright idea in my head and I ran back up the hill, knocked on the door again. God showed up and said, have you found out what you're an expert at? I said, I think so. I'm an expert at sin, really good at it, very creative. I find ways to do it over and over again, but I'm a sorry expert. I wish I wasn't an expert at that, but that's what I'm an expert at. And he laughed and he said, it's about time you found out who this place is for. Welcome inside. <laughs> that's just a sort of modern version of the parable of the Pharisee and the publican, I guess. Well, sin is, is, is insane. Uh, here, here is proof of original sin. This is, this is proof of how insane we are. We have free will. That is, we can make free moral choices. And ultimately, every choice for good is a choice for God, because that's what God is, perfect goodness. And every choice of any kind of evil is a choice against God, because God's got no kind of evil. So whether you're thinking about God or not, and even if you're an atheist, every choice that you make, every moral choice between any kind of good and evil is a choice for God or against God. You know that, that's basic. All right, so this is what a moral choice looks like. In giving you free will, God says to you, at every moment of your life, whenever there's a, a free choice, and there are thousands of them every day, I have two hands. You can choose between my right hand and my left hand. In my right hand is the secret of all joy. That's obeying my will. In my left hand is the secret of all misery. That's disobeying my will. And you know that that's true by your faith, and you know that that's true by your reason, it makes sense. And above all, you know that that's true by your repeated experience. Because throughout your life, every single time you have said, your will be done, you're happy. Deeply happy, long run happy. And every time you say instead, no, my will be done, you've been miserable. Deeply miserable. So, what will it be this time? Right hand or left hand? So what do we do? We say, Gee, that's a tough one, God, I don't know. Left hand hasn't worked yet. Maybe it'll work this time. I'm gonna try the left hand. <laughs> We're nuts. Einstein defined insanity as doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result the next time. That's what we do. We're crazy. But God loves us anyway. If you know how really stupid you are in relation to God and how much God loves you, and how precious you are in his eyes anyway, together, that'll give you a great sense of perspective with your kids. Because they're stupid too, but they're precious. <laughs> like us, just like us. That's why I don't like the title, How to Raise Catholic Kids. It sounds like raising cattle. You don't raise kids, you raise cattle. You love kids. They're little versions of you. That's what you were. And in heaven, we're all going to be the same age. And you know what age we're going to be in heaven? All the ages together. You're going to be a little kid and a teenager and a, a, an adult and an old person all at the same time. According to the saints and mystics and even little kids who have visions of the next world and see the people in heaven, whenever anybody asks how old were they, even a five-year-old will say, well, she was grandma, but she was a little girl at the same time. Or something like that. Now, a kid couldn't make that up. So my first point is uh, be sane and realistic and treat kids as what they are. What are they? Well, they're not the kids of King Kong, they're the kids of King God. They're not little monkeys. They're little images of God, they're the king's kids. Infinitely precious. 
made in his image. What are we then? Well, we're the sort of intermediaries that, that God uses. We're his foster parents, or we're their foster parents. So kids aren't problems, and they're not pets, and they're not products, and they're not cattle. And everybody knows, no matter what their religious beliefs, what the most important word in child raising is. What the most important thing to do with your kids is. Just love the hell out of them. Everybody knows that. It's wonderful how God, despite how stupid we are, preserved the most important pieces of knowledge in everybody's mind. I mean, look at the different religions of the world. How different they are. Weird conceptions of God. One God are many, good or bad. Uh, how do you get to heaven? Who is the prophet? Who's the supreme authority? What do the scriptures say? A wild mass of, of thousands of different opinions about God and heaven and the supernatural. People who don't know the religion of the world say, although well, they're all saying the same thing in different words. No, they're not. They're saying very many different things. Why? Well, because we're very stupid. It's very hard to find the truth. That's why we need divine revelation. But in morality, almost everybody agrees. Atheists, agnostics, Hindus, Buddhists, Taoists, Confucians, Mormons, Muslims, Catholics, Protestants, Jews, everybody knows that you've got to love God and your neighbor. Oh, people are to be loved, not used. Oh, people have rights and you're to respect them. Oh, you're to be just and kind and merciful. Oh, nobody disagrees with that. Or almost nobody. So God kept that practical knowledge very clear in everybody's mind. That's why there are no experts. We don't need them. We know the most important things. What's, what's hard is to do it, not to know it. Things that are really important to do are easy to know, but hard to do. Like loving each other. All right, that's point one. Point two. Be fully Catholic yourself. Why? Because you can't share what you don't have. It's a basic law of common sense and physics and philosophy. You can't have more in the effect than in the cause. You can't make something greater than yourself. You can only pass on what you've already got. So if you've got a weak faith, you might pass it on. If you've got no faith, you, you can't fake it. You won't pass it on. If you've got a strong faith, you can pass it on. So you start with yourself. How much do you believe it? Well, your kids are not going to believe it any more than you do. How much do you love it? How passionate are you? about the faith. They're not going to be more passionate than you are, not as kids anyway. They might grow up to rediscover it all over again by themselves, even if you don't have it, but don't count on that. We're so aware that we're not experts. We're so aware of our, our imperfections and, and our foolishness that we tend to be skittery and worried and ashamed. Oh, gee, I love my kids so much and the faith is the most precious thing in, in my life, and I want so much to pass it on to them, and I'm not very good at it. Oh dear, oh dear, what am I going to do? Don't think that way. Don't look at yourself. Look at God. How beautiful is he? How good is he? How, how important is he? How infinitely important to you. Well, just tell your kids where you're coming from. You don't have to fake it. You don't have to preach a sermon. You don't either have to push it like a salesman, as if you're selling a timeshare. Most aggressive piece salesman in the world. By the way, anybody want to buy a, 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 a timeshare in Florida? Really cheap. Uh, we paid $12,000 for it. We can't even get two on the, on the market. <laughs> Which of these four things is not like the others? AIDS, herpes, cancers, and a timeshare in Florida. <laughs> Answer, cancer, you could get rid of that. <laughs> okay, so the faith is not like a timeshare. You don't have to push it. But you don't have to be skittery and worried about it either. 
it's not as if you're the defendant in a court case and the IRS expert is quizzing you on your tax form. No. It, what is the faith? Well, why, why are you here? Why, why are you Catholic? Why do you love your faith? It's beautiful. What a magnificent thing we have. Well, pass that on to your kids. It's not just instruction in what the faith says. It's not just getting an A on a theology test. It's falling in love with it. They'll catch that. Kids are very smart. They catch body language, they catch emotional language, they catch uh, eye contact. If you love something, they'll know it. And if you don't really love something, they'll know it. So to pass on your love of, of, of the Catholic faith, increase your love and they'll see it. And what's the Catholic faith ultimately about and why is it so beautiful? Every time you look at a crucifix, you get an answer to that question. The most horrible, ugly, bloody, painful event in the history of the world and the most unjust and evil thing that ever happened in the history of the world, namely the murder of Almighty God, that's the most beautiful thing that ever happened. That's why Mel Gibson's bloody movie is the most beautiful movie ever made. Astonishing that God would do that for us. What kind of crazy love is that? That's magnificent. It brings tears to your eyes. Pass that on. The faith is Christ. Pass him on. If you don't know him, you don't know the faith. It's a person. It's a relationship before it's anything else. So, point three, you have to get to know him better in order to pass that on to your kids. How do you do that? Well, one of the most powerful means, one of the absolutely necessary means, which is like breathing, is prayer. So pray. Pray more. Pray better. What does that mean? Uh, techniques, gimmicks, methods? No. They don't matter. Whatever works. Just do it. It's like love. A book like The Art of Loving is a silly title. Some good things in that book and some bad things in the book, but to, to think of, of, of love as a, a, a manual, a repair manual. Step one, step two, step three. You just do it, for goodness sakes. Most important thing about prayer is do it. Honestly, passionately. Pray for your kids, pray for yourself. The most powerful weapon that you have in raising your kids you just used. Here it is. That's a nuclear bomb. Why doesn't God give us more good stuff? Because he waits for us to pray. He waits for us to ask him and ask him repeatedly and passionately. What's he doing there? Is he, is he cruel? No. He sees that what we need the most is a relationship with him. So we need prayer more than the things we pray for. So he waits until we pray before he gives us the stuff we pray for. Point four. Depending on the age of your kids, pray appropriate prayers with them. When they're little, pray with them at, at, at bedside. Watch them pray. Let them see you pray. Uh, there's different strokes for different folks here. There's no one size fits all. Does everybody have to have a family rosary? No, but it's a great idea. Should you have liturgical prayers in the house at Christmas and Easter? Sure. Uh, but is it absolutely necessary for everybody? No. Should you pray during great crises? Yes, of course. And, and, and great things that you are thankful for? Of course. Prayer should be utterly natural. And when it doesn't feel natural, do something about it. It should feel natural, as natural as breathing. And that's true of, of family prayer as well as individual prayer. And when the kids are very young, they love little, simple, memorized prayers. It gives them a the feeling of being an adult. Wow, I can do what daddy does. Point five. How strict should you be with your kids? That's the one thing parents always wonder about and ask about. Should it be strict or permissive? Well, there's two extremes. Well, give me a, a, a set of guidelines. How strict? And strict about what? 
Well, I'm sorry, I can't do that. There's no one size fits all here. The principle is pretty obvious. The principle I gave you in point one. Treat them as what they are. What are they? They're, they're, they're kids. They're not cattle. They're not babies. But they're also not saints, not yet. They will be. God won't let them alone until they, they are. You too. Uh, and they're not adults yet. So they're somewhere between animals and angels, or somewhere between angels and devils, like us. And how do you apply then that basic principle of treating everything exactly as it is? Well, from each according to his ability, to each according to his needs. That's the one very wise thing Karl Marx said. I think communism is absolutely tragic and, and stupid, but that's not communism, that, that's basic ethics. Give them what you can and give them what you, they need. So you have to understand where they're coming from, how mature they are, how responsible they are, how much to trust them with. So you have to get to know them. You have to listen to them very carefully. Uh, you don't go to the bookstore and buy a book on how to do effective parenting and then apply it. That's what you do with your car. They're not cars. And they're not broken, except in the same way that we are. They're just, you know, sinful and stupid and slow, like us. I'll give you an example of, of how this works. This is not so much about how permissive to be as about how you can't get answers to these questions from books. Some years ago, my son was about six, and one of his best friends lived next door. He was a six-year-old, too. They went to school together. Uh, and uh, they were a Jewish family, uh, Reformed Jews. They didn't believe much, but, you know, they did the holidays and stuff. Uh, and a tragedy happened because Stephen, the kid who lived next door, had uh, a cousin named Kevin who used to visit his house very often. He was about the same age. Uh, and Kevin picked up an infection and died in three days. He went from perfect health to death in three days. Very rare case. And Stephen couldn't understand that. Stephen was, was, you know, naturally out of sorts. So uh, my wife told me this when I came home from Boston College one, one day. Uh, she said, uh, uh, Judy from next door, the mother, came over and told her about this tragedy. So my wife said, what did you do? What did you tell Stephen? And Judy said, well, I went down to the bookstore and I bought a book by this wonderful rabbi about how to tell your kids about death. So my wife, very practical, she's Italian. Uh, and uh, you know, she didn't, she, she, she bit her tongue. It didn't say, what, you have to go buy a book in order to talk to kids about death? But, and, and what did the book say? Well, I read the book, Judy said, and, and I thought it was wonderful. Uh, and it, I was upset too, but the book, the book healed my soul. So, so I tried to share it with, with Stephen. And I said, Stephen, uh, it's fall now. And everything has to die sometime or other. And in the world, you see these plants dying. Uh, but God uses this uh, for new plants in the spring. It's fertilizer. So when the, the, this plant dies, it fertilizes new plants, and those new plants come up in the spring. So death is, is meaningful. Uh, and again, my wife bit her tongue and said, and how did Stephen react to that? And Stephen's mother said, that's the strange thing. I found it so comforting, but when I, when I said that to Stephen, he screamed at me, I don't want Kevin to be fertilizer, ran up into his bedroom, slammed the door, and won't eat supper. Again, my wife bit her tongue and didn't say the obvious words, your kid is smarter than you are, stupid. <laughs> Point six, assume high standards. Don't push them, assume them. Assume that your kids are going to be fair and idealistic and honorable. Teenagers, as you know, are, they're all a troubled class of people because the teenage years are troubled years. You're going through big changes. It's like 
you got one foot in the boat and one foot on the land. When you were a kid, it was all in the land. You knew where you were. You're just a kid. And when you're in the boat, you know where you are. Now I'm independent. I'm an adult sailing the sea myself. But a teenager's got one foot in the boat, one foot on the land, and, and they, on the one hand, want to be independent and instantly adult, but on the other hand, they want the security of, of being in, in the home. And that's natural. But they're very idealistic. It'll work if you assume high standards. For example, you want to get him to be moral, all right? You're tempted to say, well, the real reason for being moral is that's the right thing to do. You gotta be like God. God's the supreme standard. So be, be good for its own sake, just as God exists for its own sake, his own sake. But you're tempted to think that's too idealistic for them. So I gotta attach some rewards to it. So if you do this, uh, I'll pay you for it. Or if you do this, I'll uh, give you these extra privileges. And that's not always wrong. But the principle is dangerous. It's like bribery. If there's a question of doing the right thing, rather than just something like taking the garbage out or doing chores, which you can pay them for maybe, but if it's a question of doing the right thing, don't add anything except that's the right thing to do. Do it, period, end of story. That's what we do. We do the right thing because it's the right thing. And you'll be surprised how they'll take to that. Sometimes even, even kids that are acting up and rebellious, w once they hear that message, will respond. Point seven. As you know, because teenagers are in that one foot on the boat, one foot on the land situation, uh, they're much more influenced by peer pressure than either pre-teenagers or post-teenagers. So it's terribly important to cultivate good friends. That's why you should break your budget to send them to Catholic schools, partly because uh, they will have good Catholic friends and make, make friends with, with Catholic families so that when they, when they start dating and, and, and later think about marriage, they've got, they've got good options. I'm not saying that a marriage to uh, somebody of the opposite sex who comes from a broken family isn't going to work, it often does, but uh, a stable uh, and unbroken family is so much better in every way uh, for not only their kids, but their kids' friends, that if you're in that network of Catholic families and Catholic friends, they're doing half your work for you. Terribly important. Uh, check out the families of, the, of their boyfriends and girlfriends when they start to date. Uh, parental uh, collusion is very powerful. Point eight, Catholic education. Send them to good Catholic schools, even though it breaks your budget. It often does. Well, which, what would you rather have, your heart or your budget broken? But be sure it's a good Catholic school. Just because it advertises itself as Catholic doesn't mean it's teaching the Catholic faith. I'm assuming that you're one of the good guys. <laughs> Unless you're just ignorant and don't know where I'm coming from and think that I'm going to come here and pat you on the head and say, no matter what you do, I love you. Uh, that's okay. But uh, there's a lot of uh, Catholic schools that aren't really Catholic. They just want your money. Judas Iscariot was the first Catholic to accept a government grant. <laughs> 30 pieces of silver. And most Catholic schools are getting a lot more than 30 pieces of silver nowadays. Uh, don't trust advertising anywhere. Even though in Catholic schools, check them out. Do you have good teachers? Do you have good textbooks? Do you have a good curriculum? Are they really teaching the faith? Do they really love it? Or is it a fake? Advertising, you know, is the world's oldest profession. The devil invented it in the Garden of Eden. See this apple? You need this apple. Price, one soul. You can afford it. I'm, resist I'm trying to resist the temptation to tell my favorite lawyer joke, and I'm not succeeding. The devil walks into a lawyer's office, <laughs> and the lawyer says politely, what can I do for you, sir? 
And the devil says, no, it's what I can do for you. I can make you richer than Bill Gates, more famous than Alan Dershowitz. All you have to do is sign this little contract in your own blood, uh, giving over to me your soul, the soul of your wife and children and grandchildren down through 40 generations. The lawyer looks up, narrows his eyes suspiciously and says, what's the catch? <laughs> I'm only kidding. One of my favorite saints, Thomas More, is a lawyer. He's the only saint that didn't require any miracles to get into heaven, because for a lawyer to be a saint is itself a miracle. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Point nine. These are just uh, scattered practical points. This is not a philosophy lecture. I haven't proved anything. I haven't ordered them and outlined them in a logical order. Just scattershot approach. Point nine. If you remember one or two of these 12 points, it'll make a difference. Point nine, good books, terribly important. Don't push them though. You've got to read this book. Uh, I'll give you $10 if you read this book and I'll give you a quiz on it tomorrow morning. No, just leave a lot of good books around the house. What are good books? Well, I hope you're wise enough to answer that question yourself. Well, there's some things that are controversies. Yeah, yeah, use your prudential judgment. But clearly, there's, there's a lot of good books that kids like and, and, and God likes too. Leave them around the house and videos and movies. I read uh, all seven Chronicles of Narnia to all four of my kids. They loved them. Once I was teaching an adult education course on C.S. Lewis and it was mostly middle-aged ladies during the day. Uh, so I started by asking them why they chose to take this course, and they had different reasons, and one of them, uh, who was a grandmother, said, uh, well, uh, I took this course because I never heard of C.S. Lewis before, but uh, my daughter, when she was uh, about 12 years old, fell in love with the Chronicles of Narnia, and especially fell in love with Aslan. And she demanded that I read those books over and over to her. Uh, and then when she became 18 years old, she ran away from home, said to me, Mother, I hate you, and I hate your religion, and I never want to see you again. Ran off to California, became a, a, a drug addict and a prostitute. And the only thing that kept me sane was that she had loved the Chronicles of Narnia. And sure enough, she came home. Aslan brought her home. So I'm very grateful to C.S. Lewis. Well, powerful. The Lord of the Rings is a powerful Catholic book. It's not explicit, it's implicit, but that's even more effective. It baptizes uh, the imagination. This controversy about the Harry Potter books, uh, like William Bennett, I think they're, they're pretty good. Uh, not terribly dangerous for somebody who's not tempted to witchcraft and to take that stuff seriously, and there's good moral lessons in them. But maybe you think there aren't. Okay, then don't give the kids the Harry Potter books. But books influence them almost as much as friends. Point 10, talk to them about your faith. Why should that be hard? It's easy to talk to them about your favorite ball team or football team. Well, we're stupid. You know, I'm, I'm a big Red Sox fan, but I yell louder at Fenway Park than I do at church. Maybe we should learn something from, uh, from the black churches. Maybe we should have more hallelujahs. But at least we should move a little bit in that direction. Show them the passion. But they might be embarrassed. Yeah, so what? That's not so bad. I grew up in a Dutch Calvinist Protestant family, very pious, very honest, very good, hardworking, honest, moral, authentic people. Uh, there was an anti-Catholic strain there, but wasn't that bitter, so it didn't do that much harm. Uh, and I still remember my father uh, insisting on reading the Bible at, uh, at every dinner and uh, asking me questions about it and, and, and whatnot, and I was a little embarrassed. Uh, not really, but a little. And I wish he wouldn't pray so long and, and, and insist on those lessons, but I'm terribly grateful for them right now. The embarrassment will pass. I remember one Christmas, I must have been about eight years old, 
I wanted a really expensive Lionel electric train, a whole complete set. And we were just a middle class family and I had one cheap little train and I wanted this, this big one, which was very expensive and I kept pestering him for it. And you know, we played the Santa Claus game. Please tell Santa Claus to bring me the, uh, the train. Uh, and I pestered him so much that he, he sat me down and said, look, son, about this train. Uh, do you know why we give gifts to each other at Christmas? So I said to myself, well, I'd better behave now because if I give the right answer, I might get the train. <laughs> uh, I said, yeah, I think so. He said, why? He said, I said, because of Jesus. He said, well, what's the connection? And I said, well, God gave us Jesus, his own son. That was the most precious thing he could give us. So that's why we give gifts to each other. Very good, my father said. Now, uh, why did God give us Jesus? Well, because he loves us. Very good. And now, why do we give each other presents? Well, because we love each other. Good. So, if I give you that train, why would I do it? Because you love me, Dad. That's right. Now, suppose I can't afford to give you the train. Suppose I just don't have enough money. I wish I could give you the train, but maybe I can't. Would you still know that I love you? And I thought, oh boy, this is a trick question. <laughs> Which answer is going to get me the train, yes or no? <laughs> I know he still loves me, but if I pretend not to know that, maybe I can force him to give me the train. So I was tempted to say, no, if you don't give me the train, I'm not sure that you love me. And maybe that'll make him give me the train. But then I thought, my father's smarter than I am. And I can't fake it with him, I gotta be honest. So I said, I know you love me, Dad, even if you can't afford the train. Good, son, I'm, I'm glad. So he went away. I said, darn it, I'm not gonna get the train. Well, I did get the train. But the train's resting in the attic. The lesson is not. Point 11, here's the elephant in the living room. Sex. Main problem everybody has with the faith today is sex. All the controversies between the church and the world are about sex. All the controversies within the church are about sex. We don't argue about the Trinity. We don't argue about the sacraments, not much anyway. We don't argue about uh, uh, authority. We don't argue about the Pope. We argue about sex. Uh, we don't even like to talk about it much of the time. Homosexuality, masturbation, living together, uh, abortion, contraception, it's all about sex. Abortion's obviously about sex. What's abortion? Abortion is backup birth control. Why does a woman want an abortion? Because she's got a baby in her that she doesn't want. Where'd the baby come from? Did the stork bring it? Uh-uh. No. Oh. What is contraception? Contraception is the demand to have sex without having babies. The sexual revolution has revolutionized our society much more than any political revolution ever could. Okay, so how do you talk about that? Well, the church has given us a marvelous teaching device, a marvelous lesson about it, because whenever there's a need in society, God provides it through the church. Whenever there's a heresy, the church defines a dogma to combat the heresy. And in the past, it was usually theological heresies, and today it's largely moral heresies. So what has the church given? Well, it's given us a great philosopher, John Paul II, one of the greatest popes of all time. He'll almost certainly be known as John Paul the Great. And his theology of the body is a beautiful and revolutionary, but totally orthodox and biblical and Catholic philosophy about the meaning of sex read it up, read books about it. Uh, most of the books are kind of difficult and they're not appropriate for teenagers, although there are some that are, but get it in your head, get that big picture. When Humane Vitae came out, there were two Catholic responses, uh, pretty much only two. Number one, I don't understand this, but I accept the church's authority, so the church is right, so I will obey. Secondly, I don't understand this, and I don't accept the church's authority, so I will not obey. But both of them lacked the big picture, the understanding. It was just a rule. 
and the rule was very clear, there it is, but it was hard to obey because it was hard to understand, except in a purely legalistic way. What the theology of the body does is give you the big picture and get the rationale behind it and, and make it beautiful. It's not all about humanae vitae, it's a much bigger picture than that. But only in the light of that big picture do you see everything else the church says about sex. And it's revolutionary. George Weigel calls it a theological time bomb. Christopher West has written some very good books on that at various levels. Steve Kellmeyer has written some good books about that. I can recommend some very easily. The most important principle in talking to your kids about sex is be totally honest. Don't fake it. And that'll enable you to relax. You're not a salesman. You're not a prosecuting attorney. You're a friend. Finally, last point. In a sense, this is the, the first point. Because if you don't start here, the other stuff's not going to work. Who is the most perfect, merely human model in the history of the world? The only totally innocent person who ever lived, the Blessed Virgin Mary. Uh, she had a kid. The name was Jesus. And even she was not able to be totally successful in raising him unless she first did something which is so important that it's one of the mysteries of the rosary. It's called the presentation. What's the presentation? Well, in a sense, it's the first mass. In a sense. Here are Mary and Joseph offering up Jesus in the temple to God, saying, God, you gave us this wonder child, which we don't fully understand yet, uh, and the only thing we can do with him is to give him back to you. He's yours. We're simply your servants. So you're going to raise him, but we're going to do whatever you want to help you. That puts everything in perspectives. In, in other words, put your kids into God's hands because God's hands gave you your kids. That doesn't mean you have to be passive. God's going to do it so I don't have to do it. Just the opposite. You put them in God's hands and then God's going to talk to you and inspire you to, to do this and that and the other thing. For God to do something and for us to do something is not like two different people sharing the load, each doing it 50-50. It's more like marriage. Uh, What's the husband's role in marriage and what's the wife's role in marriage? Each one is 100%. They in interpenetrate each other's lives totally. And that's the way God wants to interpenetrate our lives, especially our lives with our kids. All right, there's my 12 points. I hope some of them are practical. Uh, now comes the interesting part. I am always amazed how polite you are uh, during the boring part, which is the lecture. But the interesting part is the question and answer session. But that's because you're Catholics and you believe that most people have to go through purgatory to get to heaven. So your purgatory is over. Now heaven starts. Questions, please. Yeah, we're gonna, Dr. Pape, if you don't mind, we're going to just we're going to get to the questions right in a moment. We're going to take a five-minute break. And during this five-minute break, while we give you a chance to take a breath and take some water, uh, we're going to do two things. You can stretch and stand, and uh, we're going to pass. This is a Catholic event. So we're going to pass a basket. And we're going to ask anyone, uh, if you'd like to donate a free will offering to support this event, we welcome it. You don't have to. We don't charge anything. But we welcome that. Uh, and if you also, if you pass the basket, if you have a, the form you filled out with your information, please also put that in the basket. And then when we come back in five minutes, we're going to give a great some questions. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. It's so good to meet you, finally. Likewise. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for your patience with all of our endless email exchanges with you. Yeah, no yes. problem. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just surprised that all the email went through because I have digital demons that have my do. computer. You do, they block them. Yes. Well, I, we pray to every email, so. Oh, that did it. <laughs> that did what it. we've done is we've, we asked them uh, before you came here to write down questions Good. that they had so we could just have it. And so I'll give you these questions and you can use these. And then at the end, after you answer a group of them, you can say, does anyone have any right. open questions at the end? Excellent. And we'll end. So it's about... 
we'll start about quarter to nine again, and we'll mm -hmm. end, let's say we'll end at quarter after nine, so Fine. About 30 minutes. Fine. Thank you, Dr. Well, the Boston plane first announced a two-minute delay, then a 30-minute delay, then a 60-minute delay. <laughs> oh so once they announced a 60-minute delay, I said, well, that is going to get me into Chicago five minutes before my Chicago plane leaves. That's not going to work. It's not going to work. So, so I went realize. to the desk and got the, the other flight. And they changed it. And, they changed and I'm so it, glad yeah. you gave us time. And what we were able to do is we were able to email and Facebook everyone, so a lot of people knew it. Right. So we were able to plan. And we it got worked. to pray the rosary, too, so that, that well, was perfect, too. it was Isn't part of Divine cool? Providence. Isn't that wonderful? God you is so good. double barrel guns instead of a single exactly barrel right. gun tonight. <laughs> Great. That's right. That's right. Yeah, sure. That's easy. Best books on logic I've ever read. Thank you. Even for you. <laughs> it's all in good fun. How are you? Good to see you. You are a lawyer? Yes. You weren't personally insulted. No. Oh, no. My, I wife do, I just, I do, my wife and I just growled at you. That's I right. teach I teach also in New York City, and I'm a, 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 a big Red Sox fan and Yankee hater, and I had the chaplain of the New York Yankees as one of my students. Oh, yeah? So we would we would just, just be mercilessly, uh, you know, insult each other. <laughs> Why don't you wear Nazi swastikas to class? Uh, ex, ex, Evil ex, empire. Excellent work, by the way. I used it when I taught a course at the law school. Great. Because half my law students have a clue about Socratic logic, mm -hmm. which is exactly what we trial lawyers do. So we got my yep. favorite guy here. Yep. Oh my yep. gosh! Little did I know. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, do you want to look at the look at these here? These are the questions. Okay. Did you have some? I'm just going to let him sign. Oh, sign it. Great okay. idea. Uh, I forgot Absolutely. my book at home. Second I appreciate thing, your comments. Right? That's right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So you can just flip through those and make sure you read them. But uh, like the first sure. one's my favorite. Because one oh, is. yes, yes. <laughs> I don't know who wrote that, but it's very Well, strange. we've we've got an identity crisis now. Since 2004, we are the new evil empire. Is that right? Well, we Well, we... We've won two World Series in the last oh, yes. four years, uh, last six years, and we finished in at least in second place almost every year. That's a very good point. So you stole that from the Yankees. We we have an identity crisis. For, 80, for 86 years, we were God's chosen people. Ah, uh, you're right. The Jews of baseball. <laughs> you will suffer. <laughs> That's fabulous. That's fabulous. So, we're, so true, true Bostonians now will move to Chicago and become Cubs fans. Oh, there you so go. So they can still be wise. That's, that's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll call them back together again. Okay. Okay, we're going to begin again. So you were on my show a while ago, Dr. Creep. John oh. Leonetti. Oh, hi. How are you doing? I just wanted to introduce myself. You're doing great stuff. John, good to see you. You've got to be careful. to uh, have Dr. Crape. He's going to answer some of these written questions we have here that we've just taken out of the bigger pile. And then uh, after he's answered for a while, he will just take a few hand-raised questions. 
and then we'll wrap up the night uh, around 9.15 or shortly thereafter. The first one is a very difficult theological mystery. How can faith be reconciled with being a Cubs fan? <laughs> it's just not right that the Red Sox got the baseball heaven first. Well, that's because we had an exorcist come to Fenway Park and exorcise the curse of the Bambino, and you didn't do that yet for the Billy Goat curse at Wrigley Field. But it is true that ever since 2004, we have been in a great identity crisis. We Red Sox fans, like you Cubs fans, knew who we were. We were the Jews of baseball, the chosen people, the superior ones, those who learned wisdom through suffering. And now we're successful. And in order for that to happen, the fundamental forces of the universe had to somehow be realigned which you saw if you were watching the, seventh, the fourth game of the World Series in St. Louis in 2004. Remember that? Yeah. Remember what happened at the very moment that the game was over and the Red Sox defeated the curse of the Bambino? Four game sweep of, of St. Louis. The camera panned to the heavens and there was a total eclipse of the moon. I kid you not. Well, uh, Boston is the educational center of, uh, of America. Uh, I like to think of, of, of America as a face turned towards Europe, where it came from, and Boston is the brains, and New York is the nose in your face, and t Washington is the mouth, talky-talky, and uh, uh, let's see, uh, Chicago is the city of the big shoulders, and uh, Los Angeles is the anus, and... Uh, <laughs> Florida is kind of embarrassingly obvious. I won't say anything about that. <laughs> but Boston has 10 times more philosophers than New York. A lot more schools, but very few schools teach philosophy anymore, but we do in Boston. Even though New York has 10 times more people than Boston. Why is that? Well, that's very simple. Philosophy is the love of wisdom. Wisdom comes through suffering. We have the Red Sox, they have the Yankees. <laughs> now, Red Sox fans and Cubs fans have always been deep brothers under the skin until 2004. Now you're envious. What is your best advice for continuing to raise Catholic kids when they are in college? Exactly the same as the advice here. Especially, check out the college. Bishop Fulton Sheen, shortly before he died, gave this advice to Catholic parents. He said, if you want your kids to lose their Catholic faith most efficiently, then send them to a Catholic college. That's a little extreme, but uh, there are places uh, where it's almost guaranteed that your faith will weaken. And most Catholic colleges, the typical, the average Catholic college, statistically, does not strengthen but weaken their kids' faith. 75% of freshmen that enter Boston College identify themselves as Catholics. That number is down to 55% as graduating seniors. And Boston College is still a pretty good place. You can get a good Catholic education if you get the right courses and the right teachers. It's not like Georgetown. Georgetown is, well, my mother would not like me to say anything about Georgetown. She used to say, if you can't say anything nice about somebody, don't say anything at all. Uh, so check them out. Uh, it's a little more intellectual at that point, but all the basic principles still work. But if you're asking me, would I advise uh, to send your kid to Boston College? Well, uh, yes, if there are two qualifications. One, you got a lot of money. Tuition there is very high. Uh, and two, the kid is, is bright and mature in his faith. He's not going to get lost. Uh, and gets a good friend and director says, take Father A rather than Father B because Father A is a Christian, Father B is a Hindu, Hindu pretending to be a Christian, he's a pantheist. <laughs> How do you explain divorce and annulment to children of a second marriage? Well, the way the church does. 
The goal is not to upset their sense of security with their family. Well, in a non-judgmental way, if there's another family that's close to yours that's explained uh, divorce and uh, that is, has experienced divorce and annulment, uh, you've got to say something like this to the kids. Uh, this will never happen here. Your father and your mother have taken a solemn vow before God uh, to stay together forever, so don't worry about divorce here. Uh, and don't say these people are bad or they, 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 they don't really live their faith. Uh, you know, the problems that were there are, aren't here. Give them that sense of security. If you're in uh, a second marriage, uh, how do you explain that to your kids? Well, you, the same way the church does. Uh, remarriage is allowed only after annulment, and annulment doesn't mean divorce. There is no such thing as divorce. Divorce is a superstition. Divorce does not exist. The state believes that divorce exists, so we go along with the state, like we go along with those who believe in Santa Claus. But uh, to get a civil divorce is just signing a piece of paper. It means nothing. But if that was a real marriage before God, the church will never annul it, unless the church is corrupt. Sometimes you can, you know, bribery happens in the church too. I mean, if you know anything about the history of the papacy, you know that the mafia once controlled the papacy back with the Borgias. So I'm not saying that, there, that the church does not make very serious mistakes, but the church's principles are very clear. There is no divorce. In all four gospels, Jesus solemnly and clearly forbade divorce. That settles it. Annulment is not a divorce. Annulment is a statement that that wasn't a real marriage in the first place. So the civil divorce is nothing. It doesn't, doesn't count from the church's point of view. You can do it, you can not do it, it doesn't matter. Just their standards. But the church's standards are, are clear and tell the kids that. Advice for how to help kids find the courage to stand up for the faith. Well, as I said before, kids want to be heroes, uh, especially guys. Girls are probably much more courageous than, than guys, but they don't need to brag and, and put it out there so they look like they're humbler and, and less courageous when in fact they're more courageous. Uh, it certainly takes courage to have children. Uh, I love Carol Burnett's famous line, if a man wants to understand what it feels like to experience childbirth, you should tell him to take his lower lip and stretch it over his head. <laughs> uh, but both guys and girls in significantly different ways want to be heroes and express courage. Courage is an absolutely necessary virtue. In this world, you cannot have any other virtue without courage because it takes a, a fight to practice virtue. Virtue doesn't come easily. It's not doing the easy thing. And they know that. Deep down, they know that. And they admire people of courage. So you don't have to push the ideals. You have to help them to do it. Now, I am not a psychologist. I am not an expert on techniques in doing that. Uh, the principle is clear. The motive is clear. You love them. You want to stand by them. Uh, you got to talk to them about it. Uh, gimmicks, techniques, I'm sorry, I can't give you too many. But for yourself, know that this is not only the right thing to do, but God is going to bless it and it'll probably work. Yeah, they'll make mistakes, they'll fall off the horse, but they'll still love the horse and get on it again. How can we light a spark in children who just don't care about their faith? Well, the spark's got to start at home. And if it's a real spark, they'll see it and they'll at least be puzzled by it and interested by it. Why are my parents so hepped up about this thing that, that to me is boring? Well, why is it boring to them? Quite possibly uh, because they've never seen that spark in you. And quite possibly because they've not seen that spark in their Catholic schools. Maybe their teachers were dull, maybe their textbooks were those astonishingly dull things. It, it, it takes, well, all four of my kids went through uh, CCD 
courses, catechism courses, and I read the textbooks, and I was amazed at how there was absolutely nothing in any of them that was in any way amazing. I mean, a, a pile of mud two feet high is not astonishing, but a pile of mud as tall as the Empire State Building is astonishing. One page of dullness is, is not astonishing, but books and books that are incredibly dull, uh, that's an achievement. Uh, if we're talking about books for catechism or, or theology courses, uh, maybe this isn't so much true anymore, but it certainly used to be true, and I think it's still largely true. The two publishers that publish most of the books are almost always putting out very dull books. They're Benzinger and Sadlier. Sadlier is even sadder than Benzinger. Uh, the best series for all levels from, from K through 12 is the Faith and Life series put out by Ignatius Press. If you want beautiful, faithful, and exciting uh, and age appropriate religious education books, look up the Faith and Life series. And if the teacher in your kid's school doesn't know about it, uh, put a bug in his ear. Maybe he'll, he or she will look at it and say, hey, that's better than what I'm using now. How do you help your kids handle statements and comments from people who put down Catholics? That's easy. Uh, the fact that anti-Catholic prejudice is the only one left in America that's still respectable is a tremendous compliment. We're like the Red Sox of religion. <laughs> the chosen people. We're special. Yeah, I'm serious about this. Uh, religious Jews uh, hold together uh, remarkably throughout history and remarkably in, in their toughness and their faith. Why? Everybody hates them. Anti-Semitism is, 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 is still alive and it's been rife throughout history and from Pharaoh through Hitler everybody wants to kill him and they can't do it. And that makes them strong. Whatever does not kill you makes you stronger. So what a compliment. Are people terribly prejudiced against Presbyterians? No. Why? Because nobody really knows what a Presbyterian is. <laughs> nobody hardly cares. <laughs> They're nice. <laughs> Catholics are dangerous. Kids love to be dangerous. Of course, you have to answer the charges. You Catholics really are trying to take over the world. No, we're not. We're loving the world. We're telling the world where there's free food. Uh, you Catholics uh, think that everybody else in the world is going to hell. No, we don't. That's ignorance. Vatican II said the opposite. You Catholics think this. Well, that's a good opportunity for educating them in the faith. That's, that's a compliment. We, we're getting the world's attention. How can you prevent your male children from masturbating? You can't prevent it. You can just tell them what the church says about it without saying that that is the biggest thing in the world and the most important thing in your life and the greatest sin you can commit uh, and it'll make you blind, you know, without, <laughs> without all that stuff, which is one extreme. Don't say, oh, well, boys will be boys. That's the sort of thing to do. Ha, 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 isn't it funny? Uh, this is a difficult sin to overcome, uh, but it is to be overcome. And maturity and strength uh, emerge from overcoming it. And uh, you should be proud of yourself if you, if you overcome it. And if not, keep trying. Don't, don't settle for anything less than what the church says is, is God's will. You gotta combine understanding and sympathy on the pastoral level with uh, maintaining the absolute standard uh, in the face of God. Because uh, when you die and you face the judgment, God will say, what kind of a parent were you? And he'll ask you two questions. Were you loving and compassionate and merciful and forgiving to your kids? And did you hold the standards high? Did you compromise either of those two? 
Speak the truth in love. That's the formula. Did you stop speaking the truth for the sake of love? That was a mistake. Did you speak the truth without love? That was a mistake. Neither one. In other words, do, do what the priest does in confession when you confess that or any other embarrassing or habitual sin. Uh, no compromise, but forgiveness. And go, at, go and sin no more. How can you integrate the theology of the, <clears throat> the body into a child's formation? Well, you first have to do that by understanding it yourself. You can't cop out by saying, oh, here's a good book. I don't have to do anything now. You have to read your kids' books. There are age-appropriate books now for kids on that. Uh, Christopher West is probably the first name you want to Google. But uh, with, with internet uh, access now, it's very easy to do research and find good stuff. How should we implement mass media and interact in the home? Well, every means should be used. Uh, with the prevalence of the mass media and the accessibility of the internet, you have vast new powers for both good and evil. Don't ignore them, don't ignore the good, don't ignore the evil. Be aware of the evil, be aware of the good, use it for good. Uh, what about the evil? Well, using it for, for the good stuff will take a lot of the power and time out of the evil stuff. But you're probably still going to want to use one of those censoring devices on your TV and on your internet because pornography is everywhere and it's very addictive. And if they hook the kids at an early age, they probably hook them for a long, long time. What do we say to a person who doesn't believe in God? Well, the first thing you say to him is God believes in you and loves you. And that's why I want to talk to you about him. He's great. Uh, and then keep the conversation going. Don't write anybody off. Especially uh, an arrogant, combative, hardened atheist. They're, they're brittle. People who say, oh, well, I'm, uh, I'm not an atheist. I'm, I'm spiritual and, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of religious. They'll probably stay that way forever. They're bored and dull and, and they're not moving anywhere. But I hate God and religion is superstition. Oh, good. Let's talk about it. You're probably going to fall next week. Like St. Augustine or St. Paul or St. Ignatius. Passion. That's what we need. If you're, if you're running passionately in the wrong direction, it's pretty easy for you to change direction. A car that's going fast north can turn around and go fast south with a lot less expenditure of energy than a car that's stalled takes to, to get up to that speed. So people who are stalled and bored about religion probably aren't going anywhere unless they have a crisis in their life. But people who are mad at, at God or at the church, good. They care. It's the first step. How do you keep your kids from being bored with mass and more excited to go and be engaged? Well, talk to them about it. Uh, start not with the mass. Start with Jesus. Start with the Gospels. Start with what the mass is about. Uh, some kids can be intrigued at the, the ceremony, the liturgy, the music, the beauty of it, but most aren't. But if they know that's Jesus, oh, that's really him? Yep. He's really just as present there as he was in the streets of Jerusalem? Yep. You mean I, I can worship him? That's God? Even though it doesn't look like God? Yep. Literally? Yep. Wow. Well, that'll, that'll do 90% of the work. If there's Eucharistic adoration in your parish, parish uh, bring the kid along for a few minutes to watch these non-insane adults just sitting there wrapped in loving attention for hour after hour, staring at what looks like a little piece of bread. That's intriguing.
How important is a vibrant high school youth group to the faith formation of our children? Obviously very important. Peer pressure is very important. Evangelicals seem way ahead of Catholics in this area. Yes, they do. So let's learn from them. Let's make friends with them and, and, and copy them. The ways of mutual understanding and cooperation between Catholics and evangelicals in the last 10 or 20 years is wonderful. Radically revolutionized uh, religion in America. We can learn a lot from each other without compromise. How do we improve Catholic identity and Catholic culture in our Catholic schools? Well, uh, here's the technique. You push this button and everything will be solved. Uh, <laughs> first of all, you have to want to do it. You have to feel passionate about it. And then you've got to find other people who feel passionate about it because you can't do it on your own. And hopefully some of those people will be in the school system. Uh, and then you just do everything that you can uh, there's no one particular thing, everything. Catholic culture, Catholic identity, that's a big thing. That's not a little thing that can be easily defined and excludes other things, so work on everything. But nothing great is ever accomplished without passion. You gotta feel passionate about it. This is why the Muslims are conquering Europe. Christians don't have passion anymore. They don't care. Muslims do. Sometimes that passion is, is, is hard and, and misdirected, but they've got passion. They care. We're losing Christendom. We're losing Europe. We deserve to lose it. They deserve to win it. How do we convince lukewarm Catholics or non-practicing Catholics to actively raise their children in the faith? Yeah, that's a tough one. Uh, I think you got to bribe them at first. I don't mean with money. I mean, let's say a bunch of parents don't care about the faith, but they want the kids to have a good education, so they send them to a Catholic school, and the kids take a theology course. But there's no reinforcement at all at home. And maybe the parents said, maybe it's not worth the money, because I don't care about religion, I don't care about the theology, all I care is a good education. All right, play that up. Bribe them with a good education. It's better than money. And you're not going to sneak religion in. That's up front. This is a religious school. They're going to get theology. The parents will say, well, we don't care about that one way or the other. Good. Uh, and I think you've got to make more contact, as the evangelicals do, and as people like Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses do, you got to do more door-to-door -door stuff uh, and, and bring those lukewarm Catholics back. The Catholics Come Home movement is a very good one. Google that. Uh, I think we tend, at least in the Northeast, where we think that we're sort of superior and sophisticated, we tend to be a little snobbish and look down our nose at, uh, at the folks who go ringing doorbells uh, for religion, but uh, I don't think we should. That's, that's a good thing to do. We've got a favorite joke in New England. Uh, what do you do when you clone together uh, a Jehovah's Witness and a Unitarian? You produce someone who goes door to door ringing doorbells and saying nothing. <laughs> on behalf of all of us, thank you, Dr. Craig, for your time.